Lord God, that is our prayer, that you would speak by your word to us here this morning, and that you would do so that we might be built up, that as individuals we might be made more like your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, in each successive moment, that you would use your words even this morning to conform us to your own heart, that your compassion would be our compassion, your mission would be our mission, your love for the unlovely would become ours. Lord, we ask that we corporately as a church would grow in the conformity with the New Testament model for a church. Lord, we just confess our own shortcomings in so many ways. As individuals and corporately, we must always aim to grow into the fullness of Christ. Let us grow in our maturity. Let us grow in our discernment. Let us never lose our first love. Let us be a beacon for the gospel and an anchor for truth as long as you give us life and breath. We ask now that you would, by your Holy Spirit, cause us to resonate with your truth in your word for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I'd love for you to turn in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We're continuing this seven-part series on seeing with the eyes of heaven. We've parachuted here into the middle of 2 Corinthians to get what I believe is sort of a must-have chapter, an apex section of Scripture that defines what it means to live the Christian life. And we've traced out the details of uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and really the end of chapter 4 as well with seven words, afflictions, home, goal, motivation, people, business, and message. We've discovered that afflictions are light and momentary when weighed in the balance of eternity, that our home truly is heaven that our goal is to be pleasing to Christ, that our motivation is fear and love, fear of the Lord and love for Christ, that people are eternal. And that leads us to number six on the list this morning, and we'll be looking at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 18 to 20, and we'll be discussing our business. What is your business? What is your business on the earth? What are you doing here? What do you busy yourself with? What do you think about? How have you arranged the priorities of your life for the time that you are here? Is your identity bound to your employment, your occupation? Is your identity bound to the things that you've collected? Is your identity bound up in the things you hope to accomplish, some bucket list of achievements? This morning, I hope to have us sort of recalibrate our business on this earth, to catch a glimpse of eternity, to see again with the eyes of heaven, and, and have that affect the way we view what we do on this earth. We need to think about how we will wish we had spent our time when we look back on this time from 10 trillion years. This micro dot, which is our earthly existence, this micro dot of time we can never get back, will be spent in ways that echo into eternity. How will we wish we had spent our time? What should we have been about? What should have been our business? This morning, I'm going to put before you the thought that our business ought to be the business of reconciliation. There's our one word to describe this next section of 2 Corinthians, reconciliation. We have an opportunity this morning through the pen of the Apostle Paul to recalibrate our earthly business, to look at his own life, his own mission, his own apostolic ministry. And, and while none of us are in his shoes, none of us are apostles, none of us are seeking to establish the church in its infancy the way he was called to do. I think we will see in his heartbeat what our business ought to be about. 
Read with me in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning in verse 18. Now, all these things are from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave to us the ministry of reconciliation, namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were making an appeal through us. We beg you, on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. How did Paul view his earthly business? This morning, we're going to answer that with three realities that help God's servants understand their business in this world. And the primary application for these would be Paul himself, but we will see that this application extends to all who would follow Christ. And so we'll sort of look in on Paul's life this morning And my prayer is that this will radically affect the way we view each day going forward from this moment. The first reality that helps God's servants understand their business in the world, number one is to know that God is in the business of reconciliation. God himself is in the business of reconciliation. And we see this repeated in two different ways in verses 18 and verse 19. Paul writes, now all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ. And then in verse 19, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Notice in verse 18, Paul begins with the phrase, all these things are from God. What are these things? What is Paul referring to in the beginning of verse 18? I believe he is going back to verses 16 and 17 and the reality of the new creature. Paul wrote there, there is now therefore No one we recognize according to the flesh. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him in this way no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. And we looked at this a couple of weeks ago, that the eyes of heaven give us a different perspective on people, a different perspective on Christ, a different perspective on everybody that walks the earth, and a different perspective on Christians. And in verse 17, we saw that a Christian is in fact a new creature, created by God, a new creature with new ideas, new affections, new power within, uh, created by God for his purposes in the gospel. This is what Paul is referring to when he says, all these things in verse 18 are from God. The new creature, which is the Christian life, and all the new things that come along with that new creation. God is the initiator of all of it. For someone to be called a new creation implies a creator. And God alone is the one who can take that which is spiritually dead and make it alive. To call things uh, into existence that previously didn't exist. To be the author and the perfecter of spiritual life. God is the one who creates all these things, all the things involved in being a new creature, being a Christian, having all the benefits of the Christian life and the indwelling spirit and Christ in us, the hope of glory. All of these things are from God. I want to give you an illustration this morning. As soon as I get rid of this frog. Pardon me. And, and I risk recycling an illustration. So bear with me if you've heard me use this illustration before. The ending does change. Air Florida Flight 90 took off in blizzard conditions from Washington National Airport January 13th, 1982, with 74 passengers and five crew members. <clears throat> with ice on the wings and ice on the engines, Flight 90 never gained more than 400 feet of altitude and only flew for 30 seconds before crashing onto the 14th Street Bridge and into the icy Potomac River. Lenny Skutnik was an assistant at the Congressional Budget Office on his way to work. He jumped out of his truck, took off his boots, got down to his short sleeves, and jumped into the icy river and swam <clears throat> to rescue Priscilla Torado. 
She was so cold that she was unable to grab hold of a rope that was lowered to her from a rescue helicopter. Lenny grabbed her and swam her to shore. Lenny Skutnik is a hero. This was a remarkable rescue by a perfect stranger. But I want you to imagine for a moment if Lenny and Priscilla had known each other prior to the crash. They didn't, but just imagine for a moment that they did. What if Priscilla had wronged Lenny in every conceivable way? Cheated him, stolen from him, lied to him and lied about him, slandered his character and made herself a bitter enemy. How would that change our view of the heroic rescue? No longer a passerby stranger boy scouting into an icy river, but a familiar acquaintance deeply offended and the offending enemy in imminent danger of an icy demise, hopeless, helpless, as good as dead. What would you do? If the one who had made your life miserable on this earth and would not let up found herself drowning in an icy river, would you jump out of your truck, throw off your boots, take off your jacket and swim in, risking your own life? By the way, another uh, person had already died trying to rescue passengers in the icy waters. The effect of such a rescue, the offended party sacrificing himself to meet the need of an enemy, this is otherworldly stuff. The effect of that kind of a rescue would turn an enemy to a friend, would it not? Turn an enemy into a loved one. This Scenario paints the picture of reconciliation, the key word in our section of Scripture this morning. Notice verse 18. All these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ. God reconciled us to himself through Christ. To reconcile is a word that comes originally from the marketplace. It means to make things meet. It involved an exchange of money or an exchange of merchandise. It was used in currency exchanges to make sure one thing was given for the other. As a metaphor, it came to refer to the exchange of peace for war or love for anger or friendship for enmity. It came to describe a transformed relationship. What was hostile is now friendly. Here's the dictionary definition of this word. The exchange of hostilities for a friendly relationship. Reconciliation assumes that a standing state of hostility exists between two parties. And reconciliation means that that hostility gets removed. In Greek culture, the normal way that reconciliation could happen is if the offending party makes amends in order to restore the relationship. If I've offended you, I do whatever it takes to take away the offense. Reconciliation could happen only once that offense was removed. Sometimes there was a mediator, a go-between, an impartial third party that helped bring about reconciliation. But listen, before God, no man can remove his own offense. You can't make amends with an infinitely offended holy God who is angry at our sin. I, the sinner, who cannot change my nature and therefore can't stop the behaviors coming out of that nature, cannot fix the problem. No man can remove his own offense before God. God, the one infinitely offended, takes the initiative, pays the offense, forgives the debt, removes the obstacle to relationship, and makes a friend out of an enemy. And listen, the 13 uses of this word in the New Testament overhaul the normal use of this word in the Greek language. Because God, the offended one, takes care of the problem. That is not the way the word is normally used. God himself transforms his enemies into his friends. God alone does this. God planned. God orchestrated. God initiated. God sent his son, John 3.16, so that every believing one in him will not perish, but will absolutely possess eternal life. 
God foreknew, God predestined, God called, God justified, Romans 8. Ephesians 1, we were made God's inheritance, having been predestined according to his purpose, the one who works all things after the counsel of his will, to the end that we who were first to hope in Christ would be to the praise of his glory. God reconciles. God is the reconciler. Sinful men do not reconcile themselves to God. Sinful men do not reconcile God to themselves. Grammatically speaking, God is never the object of this verb to reconcile in the active voice. God is never reconciled to somebody. And he is never the subject in the passive voice. This simply means that God is the active reconciler. Jesus Christ is the agent of reconciliation, and we sinners are the beneficiaries. We're not the reconcilers. And notice this word reconcile shows up five times in the three verses we're looking at this morning. This is central to Paul's identity and central to his mission in this text. Turn over to Romans chapter 5. I want you to see the relationship of reconciliation to other aspects of our salvation. Romans chapter 5, beginning in verse 8. God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than, having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved in his life. And not only this, but we also exult in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation." I want you to think about what it means that Christ died for us while we were at our worst. That little word for is a substitution preposition. That means Jesus died in the place of the believer. It was the believer's due punishment and Christ took it in full so that there could be justification. Much more having now been justified by his blood. Justification is simply that judicial decree whereby God declares a sinner to be righteous. He declares the sinner to be not guilty and to be positively possessing the righteousness that God demands. By justification, God's judicial declaration, his forensic courtroom statement to all of heaven and all creation is... That sinner who believes in me, I will treat as if he had never sinned and as if he had always done everything right. That's justification. And notice the relationship between justification, having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God. While we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved in his life. And now in verse 11, we exult in God through whom we have received the reconciliation. You see, by putting away our sin, that is by putting my sin on Christ at the cross, God is therefore able to forensically declare the believer not guilty and positively righteous. And with the sin gone, the obstacle, the barrier of offense removed, reconciliation is possible. We were reconciled, whereas before we were enemies. That state of hostility was in place before justification. So justification becomes the basis whereby reconciliation can happen. These are not synonyms. They're not identical. They're different aspects of salvation. Justification doesn't capture the relational side of salvation. It is the basis of it, but it it does not describe the relational nature of our salvation. Reconciliation does. Reconciliation means that the judge gets off of his bench and embraces the justified sinner as a friend. Hostilities are gone and friendly relations have begun. This is such a remarkable doctrine. By the way, this is one of the reasons there are so many words and so many pictures of salvation in the Bible. 
There's not one passage, not one theological term, not one illustration that adequately describes salvation and all that it means. It is like a multifaceted diamond with many angles emanating brilliant light. We sort of have to piece all of them together to start to get a glimpse of a segment of the fringes of what our salvation is in Christ. This reconciliation angle is so sweet. Notice in verse 18, God reconciled us. Who is this us in verse 18? I believe this is Paul and it is inclusive. What I mean by that is Paul has himself in mind in 2 Corinthians 5.18 and he probably has his apostolic associates in mind. That is those who in the first generation given charge by God to be the foundation layer of teaching and preaching and establishing churches and strengthening churches in the first century were given this specific task. And so Paul is reveling here in his own reconciliation to God. Think about what Paul says here. Uh, New creation in Christ, all these things are from God. Let me tell you about God. He is the one who reconciled us to himself in Christ. Me and and my fellow co-laborers in this gospel mission from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria to the ends of the earth. He reconciled us to himself. Can you believe it? This sort of autobiographical statement from Paul just leaks worship. And I'm confident that Paul never got over his own salvation, where God declared him righteous, the chief of sinners, the murderer of Christians, the persecutor of Christ, the enemy of the gospel. There was enmity in place, hostility in place that Paul knew firsthand, not just theologically, not just by a book, but he was actively hostile to God and his ways. And God reconciled him to himself, taking away the barrier of Paul's offenses so that God could embrace him as a friend. And then notice in verse 19, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. This gets bigger than Paul and his associates. God is about a business of reconciliation to a world of sinners, to to people of every tongue and tribe and nation and people who live in hostility and rebellion against him. And God is out to make friends of his enemies through the gospel. What a remarkable statement. There's a world of people who are presently at enmity with God, living in unbelief, practicing sin and rebellion, many without of care of God at all. There are others in this world who are actively trying to cover their transgressions with phony, man-made, fig-leaf religion. And all of it is a stench before God, unacceptable to Him, repulsive to His holiness, Consider the effects of the worst offense you have ever received from another human. Does that offense make you want to draw close, to do nice things for your enemy? Do you yet understand the love of God for sinners? That God loved his enemies. God loved those who made themselves out to be his enemies, who perpetuated the animosity who held their fists to his face and says, I will go my own way. Who spurned every good gift that comes down from above. Who neglected the basic fundamental command to love the Lord as God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Nobody's ever done that. And the opposite of that is to be at enmity with God. And of course, many of in our world... Uh, gilding the lily or whitewashing the sepulchered tombs, trying to make what is so ugly on the inside look palatable, presentable before one another, and hoping against hope that what we do on the outside to try to clean ourselves up is acceptable before God, and he sees through it all. And yet our God offers himself in love to such as us. And forgiveness and transformation. 
and an infinite well of love that can't be compared to anything else. What is reconciliation? It is my sin and his love turning an enemy into a friend and calling those at enmity with him now beloved. God made enemies his beloved. God's great love rescued us from God's just wrath. Truly, there is no better reality. There's a second reality we need to look at this morning. In addition to the fact that God is in the business of reconciliation, God's servants are to be in the business of reconciliation. Look again at verse 18. All these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. And then in verse 19, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. And he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. So both verses 18 and 19 begin with God reconciling sinners and end with God's reconciled becoming reconcilers of sinners. God's servants are in the business of reconciliation. In verse 18, God gave us the ministry. The word there is service of reconciliation. It's the same word as deacon, but Paul here is not talking about an office of the church. This is simply public service on behalf of the gospel. What does it mean to have the ministry of reconciliation? Well, for Paul and his associates, this meant going about the really remarkable task of going outward from Jerusalem unto the ends of the earth with, with this message that the Christ has come, the Messiah has come in the person of Jesus of Nazareth. He went to the cross and laid down his life for sinners and paid for sin in order to reconcile to God everyone who will believe in this message. And this gospel had to go out. And the unique task of Paul and Barnabas, and others who were set apart specifically for this gospel going out to Gentile regions meant that this message of God's love would go to every tongue and tribe and people and nation. It's a remarkable privilege and a heavy responsibility. And, and you know the Apostle Paul lived this with utter sobriety. We've talked already in this series how much Paul suffered to accomplish this service, this ministry, this privilege of taking Christ to the ends of the earth. Notice verse 19, God has committed to us the word of reconciliation. He has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Uh, committed here is the idea of entrusting or investing somebody with something this indicates, again, that this is God's business. This reconciliation business is His, but He uses means to accomplish it. God is the initiator, God is the reconciler, and yet He is going to use human means, those whom He has reconciled, to carry about this word of reconciliation, to invest in them the proclamation of this word and the, the ministry of this reconciliation. By the way, the verb form of this word committed indicates a self-interest on the part of God. God is entrusting the word of reconciliation to those reconciled for his own benefit. What does God get from this investment? What does God gain by it? What is he expecting and what will he get as a return on this investment? Uh, number one, God gets a people for his own possession. Remember that Jesus told the woman at the well, God seeks worshipers, those who will worship him in spirit and in truth. 1 Peter 2.9 describes all believers as a people for God's own possession. This is the echo of the refrain throughout the Old Testament that God would be their people and they, uh, that, that they would be God's people and God would be their God. A, a mutual ownership, an identity, and a relationship. God is out to get a people for himself, a people for his own possession. And God gets that people, Revelation 5, 9, from every tongue and tribe and people and nation on the earth. And Revelation 5, 9 is this look forward to the future, fast forward the tape and see that God's intentions come to fruition as people from every tongue and tribe and nation and people surround the throne of the lamb in worship, having been redeemed by his blood, purchased from the earth by his sacrifice. And God, of course, gets glory. 
from this exchange, from this enterprise. Ephesians 1.14 says it this way. We, the Holy Spirit was given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory. And this word reconciliation, uh, we are reconciled to God, it comes with this uh, self-interest in God most of the times it is used. God has set out for a purpose to bring himself glory by showing kindness and love to the unlovely by reconciling his enemies to himself. We'll look at this word of reconciliation next week as the message of the cross of Christ. This will be spelled out for us in verse 21. Now, as we think about this ministry given, the, the primary referent to this would be Paul and his associates and their apostolic ministry. You remember that in 2 Corinthians, Paul is defending his own apostolic ministry before the Corinthian believers. They are tempted to look at that which is external. They think of things in human terms. They see the flesh and the, the outward appearances of things. And, and Paul is set out to rearrange their understanding to, to help them understand what God sees and, and what is true at the heart. In 2 Corinthians 12, later in this letter, Paul details that the Corinthian believers thought him to be crafty, scheming, burdensome, weak, unimpressive, trying to get something out of them for himself, wanting to take advantage of them, deceitful. But notice in 2 Corinthians 12, you can turn there and look at verse 14. Paul corrects these impressions, and this would be a difficult position to be in for the Apostle Paul, not wanting to commend himself or, or, or defend something personal about himself, but certainly wanting the gospel motivation of apostol apostolic ministry to be defended for the benefit of the Corinthian believers. They needed to understand that the genuineness of the apostles, the real apostles in their ministry, putting forth a pure gospel, not motivated by money, not motivated by impressions, not motivated by fame and popularity, not wanting to uh, take advantage of others for their own benefit, to know that the gospel came with messengers who were selfless would actually be important for them in believing and holding on to the gospel against those who had selfish motives. And so Paul extensively in this letter defends that ministry. Notice in 2 Corinthians 12, 14, he says, Here for this third time, I'm ready to come to you. I will not be a burden to you. I do not seek what is yours, but you. And you hear Paul's love here. I don't want what you can give me. I just want you, beloved Corinthians. And look down at verse 19. All this time you've been thinking that we're defending ourselves to you. Actually, it is in the sight of God that we have been speaking in Christ and all for your upbuilding, beloved. All for your upbuilding. And you see Paul's selfless heart and many times misunderstood and maligned by the Corinthian believers, and still persevering in love, he resembles his Savior in this. And the Corinthians need to benefit from understanding what is it that motivated Paul's ministry. That's where 2 Corinthians 5 fits in. What is Paul saying? Uh, God has reconciled me and us apostles to himself through Christ. He gave us the ministry of reconciliation. God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and he has entrusted us this word of reconciliation. This is part of Paul's commending gospel ministry to the Corinthian believers. Why do faithful Christians share the gospel? Because they want something out of someone else? This is what makes it hard for me to play pickup basketball games at the, at the local gym, you know, People get around to saying, so what do you do for a living? After I've been laboring to share the gospel with somebody, and then it comes out, I'm a pastor. What was that? I'm a pastor. Oh, okay. So now I understand it. That's your gig. It's like the guy who sells Tupperware. Tupperware. If guys, do any guys sell Tupperware? No, they don't. But he shows up at the basketball court, and all he can talk about is Tupperware, and, and then people realize, oh, I see where you're going with it. That's your angle. 
You're, you're networking. Listen, a faithful Christian is not networking to try to get something out of other people by having them believe in Christ. A faithful Christian is just simply one who's been rescued and is saying, I want you to know my rescuer so that you can be rescued. That's Paul's heart in this. And that's why Paul's heart is imitable. This is why this ought to be the heartbeat of the Corinthian believers as they take the gospel to other people. And it's why it ought to be the heart of us who know Christ here in this room. A number of churches I've been in have a, a sign at the door. You know, we have, we have signs on the outside of the door that say, come in and join us at these times. Uh, some churches have a sign on the inside of the door that says, you are now entering your mission field. Have you seen those? It's a helpful reminder. What does it mean to, to be here together with those who know and love Christ, to, to remember our reconciliation to God from being enemies to being friends, and then to walk out of these doors? to a world still at enmity with God. What do they need? This is Paul's heartbeat. This is in keeping with Paul's whole life mission. Turn to Acts chapter 26. In Acts chapter 26, Paul is before King Agrippa, and he has been dogged by enemies and arrested and in jail and hauled off for various trials. We won't read the whole of Acts 26, but I want to focus on verse 16. And here Paul is describing to King Agrippa what has happened to him from being a, a persecutor of the way, a persecutor of the church, a persecutor of Jesus and his followers. And Jesus met him on the road to Damascus and said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Verse 16, but get up and stand on your feet for this purpose I have appeared to you to appoint you a minister and a witness, not only to the things which you have seen, but also to the things in which I will appear to you, rescuing you from the Jewish people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the dominion of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. What is Paul saying to King Agrippa? Jesus turned my life around. I was his enemy. Now I'm his messenger. I'm his friend and his ambassador. And Jesus told me he's going to send me into a world of enemies. Jewish enemies and Gentile enemies, and there's no other kind. That's everybody. Everywhere I go, hostility to the gospel, hostility to God. And why is God sending me into a world of enemies? And he says it right here, verse 18, to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the dominion of Satan to God, so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance, inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. God is sending the Apostle Paul into enemy of the gospel territory, enemy of God territory, enemy of gospel messenger territory to make friends of enemies. And how is he to do that? Just open their eyes. How does a human being open eyes? Take someone who is blind and cause them to see. How does any human being take someone who is spiritually blind and cause them to see and know and understand spiritual truth? This is an impossible task. Jesus said to Paul, I'm sending you to enemies to do things you're not capable of doing. So that... They may be delivered from darkness to light, from the dominion of Satan to God. They may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance of those set apart by faith. Listen, the impossible task Paul was given at great cost to himself is the only hope for sinners. And all of us who know Christ to this day are beneficiaries of this very task. That somebody came and proclaimed a word of reconciliation, and by the proclamation of that word, opened blind eyes. And this says nothing about the skill of the orator, nothing about the skill of the messenger, right? This, 
This only says something about the supernatural power of the one who sent the messenger. If Paul is supposed to go do eye surgery, what does Paul have at his disposal? A, saw, a rusty sawzall and a giant flathead screwdriver. Go do eye surgery, Paul, on your enemies while they're squirming. And eyes are supernaturally open. And what do we give credit to for such things? The, the, the skill of the apostle or the skill of any of us? No, of course not. But the brilliance and genius, supernatural precision of the eye surgeon who wields tools like Paul and me and you believers to accomplish supernatural things with rusty sawzalls and giant flathead screwdrivers. God does amazing work. And this is what God sent Paul to do. Paul knew who he was and Paul knew what the task was before him. And he puts this before King Agrippa in such remarkable ways. Look down at verse 27 of Acts 26. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? Here he is on defense for preaching the gospel. He's in trouble with the law. And, and what is Paul doing? Fulfilling his commission right here with the law. What is he telling the law? What is he telling the king? Do you believe the prophets? I know that you do. Agrippa replied to Paul, in a short time, you will persuade me to become a Christian. And Paul said, I would wish to God that whether in a short or long time, not only you, but also all who hear me this day might become such as I am, except for these chains. The heart of the apostle Paul. At a time where we would be tempted to find some loophole in the law, uh, get out of trouble. Can't I just go free and preach the gospel freely wherever I want to? No, Paul right here in chains for the gospel is preaching the gospel. He is living out this mission. So believers for us, we've been reconciled. And we have been reconciled to God in order to be ministers of reconciliation. We're not Paul and his associates defending ministry integrity before the Corinthian church. But the great commission of the apostolic age would only be completed to the ends of the earth if disciples make disciple making disciples. And that's us. Is your own heart not gripped when you think of your own salvation and reconciliation to God? We've been reconciled to God in order to reconcile others to God. Our business is to be God's business. And God is in the business of reconciling enemies to himself. Think again about how 2 Corinthians has led us to rethink everything through the lens of eternity. Our afflictions light and momentary. Our home is heaven. Our goal is to please Christ. Our motivation is the fear of the Lord and, and the love of Christ. People are eternal. It only makes sense then that our business would be the business of reconciliation. If we do the math on eternity, we understand how long eternity is compared to how short this earthly existence is. And we understand the fear of the Lord. And we realize that every person lives forever, either under the just wrath of God for their sin or forgiven and free in Christ to live with him. And we have been rescued. We ought very naturally to boast in our rescuer. It ought to be the easiest thing for us to talk about, to lead others to that same rescue. Ronald Reagan, in his 1982 State of the Union address, recognized Lenny Skutnik's heroic rescue of Priscilla Torado. And no doubt, Priscilla Torado would not be ashamed to tell others of her rescue. And Christian, you have been rescued from a far greater demise by a far more staggering rescue as one so unlikely to be rescued. We have much more to boast in. How ready are you to boast in what Christ has done for you? You've been reconciled to God by the death of Christ. You have not yet been taken home, so you're left here on this earth for what business? for the business of reconciling others to God. Are you busy about that business? 
God is in the business of reconciliation. God's servants are in the business of reconciliation. And third reality this morning, God's servants represent him in his business of reconciliation. Look at verse 20. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were making appeal through us. We beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. This therefore naturally follows. What does it mean for us to have the word of reconciliation? It means that we represent him. We are ambassadors for Christ. You know what an ambassador is, a messenger and a representative, one who speaks for the king, represents the king in a foreign land, represents a nation. In the ancient world, as well as in the modern world, to mistreat an ambassador was to mistreat the king, to insult the nation, maybe even to make a declaration of war. There were serious ramifications for an ambassador to accurately represent the king or the nation. You couldn't speak your own opinions. You didn't make decisions by your own will that affected the nation. You didn't address foreign dignitaries or foreign nations in your own name, your own authority, or your own message. You certainly couldn't make promises or threats or enact treaties on your own. You must only and faithfully represent the message of the king and your nation. And notice what Paul says here, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were making an appeal through us. Um, He's not saying here, it's as if God is. No, God actually is making appeal through us. We are his means. Paul here is speaking about the manner by which we (laughs) ambassadize. We do our ambassadorship. How do we do that? We do that in a manner that is in keeping with God making appeal. That is, we do God's business God's way. We can't change the message or the method. It also means that we don't go to sinners enslaved in their sin with cold indifference. We don't just say, us four, no more. I, have to, I know I have to preach the gospel, so I'm just going to preach the gospel. I don't really care about people. No, we, we, we must go with compassion the kind of love that goes with the gospel, the kind of love by which we were rescued, God's love in and through us. We are his ambassadors. As though God were making appeal through us, we make appeal. We want to be like him, compassionate appeal that sinners turn. Can you truly give a gospel proclamation without love? What is that? What good news is the good news without the love of God? And if your actions, your demeanor, or your words go against the very love of God you say you're proclaiming, you have missed something, Christian. Do you love your enemies? Do you love those who do not yet know Christ? Or do you despise people out of Christ? Does does your heart break? When you walk out of these doors, when you walk into a classroom, when you walk into a, 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 the cul-de-sac in your neighborhood, when you walk into the set of cubicles in the office, is your temptation to build a closeted, protective fortress of Christian bubble wrap? Or do you eagerly seek opportunity and audience with those who do not yet know Christ? Listen, there's something liberating about verse 20. This isn't your message, Christian. Someone who disputes with the gospel is not fundamentally disputing with you. They're disputing with your king who offers himself in mercy and love to any who would hear. The ambassador was not to be personally offended when the nation was offended. He could feel the insults to his king, but it's not fundamentally his message. I would turn your attention to Jeremiah 26 and and just write that down and maybe meditate on it this afternoon. I I won't um, read it for you. But it is a section where Jeremiah puts God's message of mercy and a free offer of forgiveness and a relenting of God's judgment before God's people. And Jeremiah's hearers said, let's kill him. (laughs) What? What? Here's a message of hope and life and forgiveness, peace, joy, prosperity, everything that God was offering to Israel at this point. And they did not want it. 
They rejected it so hard that they were willing to kill the messenger. And Jeremiah said, do whatever you want to do. Do what seems best in your eyes. But this message is life. Jeremiah 26 is a wonderful meditation for those of us who are tempted to feel discouraged when people reject the gospel. This is a tremendously liberating reality that we are ambassadors, God making appeal through us. This is his message. If our perspective is eternal, if we have the eyes of heaven on the people around us, then our business must be about reconciliation. If we have heaven's eyes on our time spent and business done, uh, we ought to think about that great white throne judgment in Revelation 20 where the unredeemed, wicked, dead are lined up for assessment before the living God. Have you ever thought about that line of people? And will there be people there with whom we've crossed paths here? Where there would be people there who could say, hey, I knew that Christian. They never told me how to get out of this. You see, to have the eternal perspective that Paul is enjoining for us in 2 Corinthians 5 is to think forward about people and to think presently about our business. Who will be in that line whom we neglected in this life? Did fear shut our mouths? Did temporal distractions catch our eyes? Did cold indifference close our hearts? We cannot get back time and opportunity. I'll close with a letter Charles Spurgeon wrote to his son in 1874. Time flies, he wrote, and the opportunity for doing good flies with it. However diligent you may be in the future, you can only do the work of 1875 in 1875. And if you leave it undone now, it will be undone to all eternity. The diligent attention which you give to business, to the careful purity of your daily life, and to your concern to do common things in a right spirit, all of those are real service for the Lord. The hours in which your earthly calling is industriously followed for Christ's sake, those are really hours of work for Jesus. But still, this cannot satisfy you, or at least I hope it cannot. As redeemed by the precious blood of Jesus, you feel that you belong to him and you long to show your love to him by actions directly meant to extend his kingdom and to gather in sinners whom he loves to bless. When once such efforts are commenced, they become easier and a kind of hunger to do more seizes upon the heart. It is not toil, but pleasure. And if God blesses what we do, it rises from being a common pleasure to become a sacred delight. Whatsoever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. It is not for me to suggest what form your service shall take. That must be left to yourself. And half the pleasure of it will lie in the exercise of a sacred ingenuity in discovering the work for which you are best adapted. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you have suited each precious believer in this room by reconciling them to yourself, by declaring them not guilty, by declaring them to have done everything right by the free grace of your love and the gospel, taking all of their sins and putting them on your son and eliminating them totally. That every drop of your wrath against believer's sin was extinguished in the effective cross of your son. And now reconciled to you, we become reconcilers of others to you. And we pray, even as Charles Spurgeon enjoined his son, that it would be our business to extend your kingdom and to take the delight and the joy in, in finding it to become easier with practice and to delight in the ingenuity of finding the way you've suited each one of us to this task. We thank you for the mothers in this room who faithfully put the gospel before children in their home. We thank you for those who go to workplaces and sports teams and classrooms and, and neighborhoods with your gospel as ambassadors of mercy. And we're so thankful for Wayman and for Massimo and for Zach, for Ryan and for others who have 
set themselves to the task with their families of taking the gospel far beyond these walls. We thank you for Gilbert Bible Church and ask for fruitful ministry as they seek to take the gospel east of us. And we pray for the hope of a church plant in New Orleans where perhaps a, a precious segment of us will, at, at cost to this body, take the gospel to New Orleans. And we pray even now for the preparation of hard soil, for the breaking up of hard ground, for the preparation of hearts to believe the gospel once proclaimed. Lord, we pray for every single one of us as we walk out of these doors today to see our mission field, to see a world at enmity with you, many of whom are objects of your affection and love who will hear and believe the gospel because people simply in faith and simple trust opened their mouths to proclaim it. You know our imperfections. You know the blunt instruments we are in your hands, but we pray that you would do supernatural precision work to open the eyes of the blind, to transfer them to your kingdom, to make them a people for your own possession and all for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.